Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! During the Brexit referendum, my next guest was one of the most outspoken, outspoken supporters of the European Union. Now the new Justice Secretary, David Liddington, has problems closer to home on his plate. The still-burning row over the Grenfell Tower inquiry, the state of Britain's prisons, and he joins me now. Can I start with the Grenfell Tower sure. inquiry? Do you have absolute confidence in Sir David Morbick as the chairman of that inquiry? Yes, I mean, the, the way this worked is when the Prime Minister wanted uh, a full-scale public inquiry, I called the Lord Chief Justice, so the head of the judiciary, and said, please, can you find us a judge with the right background seniority to take this on and get to the truth? He came up with Sir Martin Morbick, who is somebody held in huge respect by his fellow judges. He's somebody who's got no interest in this other than to get to the truth and see justice done. What the residents and other people living in the area seem to fear is that the remit will be too narrow. Who actually sets the remit for the inquiry? Well, the remit, under the law, the 2005 Act, the law, the, the, the terms of reference are ultimately set by the chair of the inquiry, the, the judge, in, in conjunction with the department that is commissioning the inquiry. So you are involved so this, in the well, remit? Well, no, I, I, I am. But the department commissioning this will be the, the cabinet office and number 10. I, I play the role of just asking the judiciary to find, the chief, the chief justice to find the judge to, to, do, to do the job there. And what Sir Martin is doing, as was promised, is to consult the residents, try to make sure that their expectations are taken into account. So the government could say to Sir Martin, can we have a slightly broader remit than you've suggested? We've got to be careful about one, one thing, because this has come up in the debate about the, the scope of the inquiry. Uh, the inquiry doesn't look into criminal guilt or innocence. There's a separate police inquiry going on into that matter already. What a lot of the residents seem to be worried about is that part of the story of the terrible thing that happened there was about years and years and years of underfunding in local government. It's essentially a political story which might put Conservatives in the dock and that therefore the inquiry is being narrowed to avoid well, that. I, th I think when we've looked at uh, what's come out in the last few weeks since the Grenfell tragedy with tower blocks in authorities of all political colours failing the, the combustibility test, um, fire regulations, you know, if we want to start pointing fingers, um, you know, brought in under the, under the Blair government. I mean, look, all political parties, I think, need to do some soul-searching about this. I'm very confident we'll get a, some terms of reference that will get to the truth about what happened, not just in terms of, you know, what happened on that particular day in Grenfell Tower, but, but, but what the regulatory decisions and, and the responsibilities so that led up to that. If well. regulatory failures and, frankly, spending cuts were partly to blame for the story, that will come out from the inquiry. I'm, well, it's up to Sir Martin to determine exactly how the inquiry goes. Of course, he can compel any witness to attend under pain of a criminal offence, and he can compel witnesses to give evidence under oath as well, and evidence in his inquiry can, if the Police and Crown Prosecution Service think it justifies it, later be used for a criminal investigation prosecution as well. So I think that he is very, very determined to get to the full truth about this. Are you content with the state of Britain's prisons under your government? No, I'm not content with the state of prisons and frankly this is a, a state of affairs that has gone back under successive governments and I, what I'm determined to do is to try to bring about improvements, build on what my predecessor, Liz Truss, did in getting extra prison officers, in putting in place some uh, effective measures to detect more accurately the problem we have with drugs, the new challenge we have with drones and mobile phones in prison, so they're more secure places, but also want to see us get better as a country at using the time during which we have people in custody to get them better educated, get them better trained, more employable, okay. so there's a stronger chance they lead a law-abiding life when they get out. Since 2010, attacks on prison staffs have gone up by 81%, and, uh, sorry, attacks on staff have gone up by 140%, and prison assaults are up by 81%. Why? I think it's a number of different things, but I think one reason is that, in, certainly in recent years, that we've had this new problem of what we used to be called legal highs of psychoactive substances, artificial drugs, coming into prisons in a big way. We find a prison population that shifted in character over that period of time. 
Um, we've got more gangsters. We've got a higher proportion of the prison population that are sexual and violent offenders. It's not just you know, your young burglar that's in prison. And so now. you need more people to look after them. You cut, as a government, 7,000 frontline prison staff. Um, I know you're, you're hiring a few more thousand now, but you're still way down on 2010, and that is also surely part of the story. Well, what happened in 2010, as uh, the case with my ministry, as with every other ministry, is that in the face of the deficit, some very tough decisions had to be taken. What's happened in the years since then is that as we managed to bring the deficit down, have restraint on public sector pay, take through some of the welfare reforms, it's brought us the breathing space to hire extra staff in areas like prisons where we do need to deploy them. Now, Liz Truss got agreement from the Treasury to 2,500 additional police officer, uh, prison officers to come in. About 500 of those have been deployed already, and our plan is to have all of them fully trained and deployed by the end of next year. But I put it to you, that's not enough. Um, the Chief Inspector of Prisons says that Britain's prisons have become unacceptably violent and dangerous places, and that is in part because of the cuts that were made to the prison staff. That I, I don't dissent from the view that the, what the, what the uh, prison inspectors describe, that this is an unacceptable state of affairs. There is also too much self-harm in prison, which means we need to uh, deliver better mental health assessments and mental health care than we're doing at the moment. These are problems and that the government's determined to Do you accept to, to this, is, this is partly due to down to prison officer numbers? Let me read you what the uh, Justice Select Committee said. It is not possible to avoid the conclusion that efficiency savings, staffing shortages and other factors have made a significant contribution to the deterioration in safety. Are they right? You need, we need to get numbers up. I don't disagree with that, but we need to do other things too, improving regimes, get better, as we are getting better, at detecting illegal drugs and mobile phones inside prisons and using our capital programme, um, about one and a half billion pounds, to close some of these antiquated Victorian prisons that actually tie up staff unnecessarily sure. and have new prisons that are easier for staff to control and manage effectively. I'm not going to quite let the staffing thing go yet because the Chief Inspector himself says that you need another 8,000 staff in prisons, not the few hundred that you've put in. I put it to you that every single red warning light around your desk from all the committees, <laughs> all the blogs, all the reports, all the statistics is flashing red at the moment and that as the new Justice Secretary, as a fresh broom, you need a really urgent review of Britain's prisons. I think that we had a good strategy for the improvement of both security and regimes in prisons that was published earlier this year. That's a strategy for prison security and prison reform that I'm determined to follow through. But one thing... And you I'm, say it's a good but, strategy, but, I mean, in the past I, year alone, assaults are on staff for up to 38%. I said this, this, this came out earlier earlier this year, and one of the key objectives is to bring down the levels of both violence and self-harm inside prisons, and the strategic document set out a number of policies that we were intended to secure that. I also, one thing that struck me, even just four weeks of doing this job, is that there have been too many occasions, I've looked at the first lot of uh, inspectors' reports and ombudsman's reports across my desk, and it seems sometimes recommendations have been made in the past that have not been followed through and implemented. One of the things that I've said is we must get a lot better actually delivering on the changes the inspectors want to see. And fast, because the actual situation in prisons is pretty horrific. There was a case in Norwich last week of a guard being stabbed in the yeah. neck. And one of the prisoners said, the situation is now there are so few staff that the prisoners are actually safeguarding the staff, not the other way around. It is a real, real crisis. And again, I put it to you, as the new Justice Secretary, you should be going to the Prime Minister and saying, we really need to look at prisons much more seriously. We need to spend some more money and fast. I'll certainly be pushing forward very vigorously with the programme of prison reform and with measures to increase security, reduce the levels of violence in prisons, which I agree are unacceptable. Around the Cabinet table, we will be discussing all these issues about different, right. different priorities in the context also of the need to be aware that we have to find the funding for any, any public spending that we agree. I understand that. Let me turn to Brexit. As I said at the beginning, you were a very fierce supporter of the European yeah. Union during that referendum campaign. And we're now told that we can, we can have all the benefits of the single market access without being inside the EU. Can I just play to you what Michel Barnier, the UK's chief negotiator, said about this this week? I've heard some people in the UK argue that one can leave the single market and keep all of its benefits. That is not possible. I've heard some people in the UK argue 
that one can leave the single market and build a custom unions to achieve frictionless trade. That is not possible. And that is the truth, is it not, that we face a really tough choice between having the free access to the single market, having all of those advantages, and effectively staying inside the EU despite the referendum, or getting out completely and not having those advantages? Well, I, I actually don't think that what Michel Barnier said in that clip was uh, terribly different from what the Prime Minister acknowledged in her letter to Donald Tusk the day Article 50 was triggered, when she says, look, our EU colleagues have said the four freedoms are indivisible, therefore we accept well, that we, we can't simply have some, but, but, but not accept all but of them. David Davis talks about it being the exact same benefits after we leave. Barney is making it absolutely clear that can't be the case. Oh, I think we, we need, in the negotiation that's forthcoming, to try to get the best possible access for our businesses to Europe and freedom to operate within the European market and for European businesses to do so here. But what the, what the government faced was basically a choice. There were two models once the people had taken the decision to leave the EU. One was you went for something like Norway, you're in the, the, what's called the European Economic Area. That means you have to accept all four freedom. You have to accept freedom of movement and you must also accept you must pay all in. the... You must certainly pay in but all the rules and regulations that Europe makes uh, to govern business and trade affairs, you have to implement, though you've got no seat at the table when those decisions it's, are taken. It's or, been called government it's by facts. Government by facts. That's, well, that's not what Norwegian so, ministers have said to me. The other, so the other model, which is what the government's decided to go for, is a very ambitious trade and cooperation agreement, sort of a line that a country like Canada has got, but we hope, because we are already working to EU standards, a more ambitious one and bringing in things like security and judicial and police counter-terrorist cooperation too that enables us to be outside the jurisdiction of the European Union. We will have left uh, but we will continue to build this new okay. deep and special partnership with our you, EU colleagues. Can I ask you a very straightforward question then? Is it possible for British business to have as good access to the single market as it does now once we've left the EU? That will depend not just on us, but on the EU27. Surely the answer at, is no. Look, it, look at what the repeal bill is doing. That is going to repeal the European Communities Act in uh, the jurisdiction mm. of the EU in this country, but at the same time put all current... EU legal obligations and regulatory obligations and standards onto a British legal basis. Mm. Now, if the EU decides uh, to introduce some more restrictive or protectionist measures in the future, clearly we would not be com in compliance with those. But it seems to me it is in the mutual interests of everybody, us and our 27 neighbours and friends, to try to make sure that our businesses all prosper from having access to each other's markets. You thought during the referendum campaign that leaving the EU would be a catastrophe for British business and British prosperity. Looking now from where you are and looking at what Donald Trump and uh, Mr Modi and Xi mm. have said at the G20, do you now regret what you said then? No, I don't. I, I, and I, you know, I took a very firm view in that campaign and before that I thought British interests were best served, both strategic and economic, by staying within the EU. But the people took a different decision as they were democratically entitled to do. And I don't think if you call yourself a Democrat, you can somehow say we should just set that aside and ignore it. That would do immense harm to public confidence you, in democracy. Do you think a big new trade deal with Trump's America, for instance, could make up most of the damage done by leaving the EU? It wouldn't be enough on its own, no, but it would be a, a very good thing to have, as would trade deals with the emerging economies of mm. Asia and Latin America. And certainly one of the frustrations sometimes about being part of the EU is that while the mass of the EU gives it some leverage in yes. international trade, it moves sometimes at a tortoise-like pace because all the member states mm. have to agree a common negotiating position. So actually so, having so the, the nimbleness and flexibility yeah. to deal with this bilaterally, and we would still be the you know, fifth or sixth biggest economy in the world, that does give us some opportunities there. All right. You've seen, you're a grown-up, you've seen all the papers, you've seen the yeah. extraordinary stories coming out from your colleagues, uh, Andrew Mitchell and others, saying that the Prime Minister has really lost so much authority that she can no longer be in charge of this process and has to make way, possibly for David Davis or somebody else. What is your message to your colleagues who are so busy at summer parties well, saying this the, kind of thing? I think, well, I, I think the summer parties is, is the key to this. I mean, look, I've been in Parliament 25 years and almost every July, combination of too much sun and too much warm Prosecco leads, leads to gossipy stories in the media. But the, 
Uh, the key thing is this. The public's had an election. I think they want the politicians to go away and deal with the real problems that people in this country okay. are facing. Social care, right. digital technology, we need to get on with that task. I That's will, what the PM's I, I, doing. I will leave you to go away and deal with those problems very shortly, but time is running out.